Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this event of the International Literature Festival Berlin. Today, I'll be talking with Leslie Neca Arima and Carmen Maria Machado. And these two women are so accomplished and amazing. I can only give a brief glimpse uh, of what they've achieved, but I'm going to introduce them briefly. So, uh, Leslie Neca Arima is the author of a collection called what It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky, which was published in 2017 and won the Kirkus Prize. She was listed as one of the United States National Book Foundation's Five Under 35. And in 2019, her short story, Skinned, was awarded the Kane Prize. Uh, she's also won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and the O. Henry Award. She grew up in Nigeria, the UK, and the US. Carmen Maria Machado is the author of the memoir In the Dream House and the short story collection Her Body and Other Parties, uh, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. She has won the Bard Fiction Prize, the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction, the Lambda Literary Award for LGBTQ Nonfiction, the Brooklyn Public Library Literature Prize, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize. She is the writer in residence at the University of Pennsylvania and lives in Philadelphia. Um, the structure of this talk is going to be that we'll talk a little about craft and then a little about content and then a little about feedback that these two have gotten from readers. Um, and so that's where we're headed. Uh, to start, could both of you tell me how horror writing entered into your writing practice, if it felt like an experiment at first and if you knew right away that it was a feminist tool for you. Uh, Leslie, let's start. Um, yeah, so how did horror enter my life? Well, I grew up in the church, and so I feel like um, that's an, uh, you know, there's always a, a threat of internal damnation, and, you know, and the um, faith my family practiced was particularly charismatic, so there were things like demonic hauntings and possessions and and so you know malevolent spirits uh, you know, abounded and so I think that horror had always been a part of I guess like my storytelling um, foundation like and, and when I say storytelling foundation I mean you know I did not realize at the time that I was building a foundation or, um, of storytelling but it, it, that's what it was um, and I also I was also um, I'm also very easily scared. Uh, I said was, you know, because I was, but I, I still am, I think. I'm pretty easily scared. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, there's something that appeals to me about um, sort of striking at that very visceral um, part of uh, the human emotional spectrum. Um, so when I did um, eventually uh, start to write horror, um, it was it was a bit of a surprise in the sense that um, I knew that I was writing this sort of magical realism, etc. Uh, I did not expect the dark turn that the story took, um, but a lot of my stories often take a dark turn, so I should have. Um, and it was uh, I knew I was writing a feminist story, um, and now you know, thinking of how you know, in that particular story, the horror and um, and sort of you know this feminist feminist ideas about motherhood. Um, it, it was a natural fit uh, to have those uh, two elements in conversation with themselves. Was it uh, who will greet you at home? Was that the first sort of oh, horror story, yes. right? Oh wow, what a um, it's a, an amazing story, um, and to have it come out sort of so fully formed like that. Um, is, is very impressive to feel your way along like that. Um, what about you, Carmen? So, uh, like Leslie, I, I sort of grew up, I mean, I, I had this sort of similar and different experience in that I grew up when my family was religious, but was fairly like middle of the road and not, did not belong to a super charismatic or 
intense denomination of Christianity. However, I fell in with a gang of evangelicals when I was like in <laughs> middle school. Um, and because I, I like, I think so many teens wanted to feel something and the desire to feel something and the desire to have the sense of something that's outside of yourself was very, very strong. And with that, of course, came you know, I mean, I think I remember like having the realization in real time. Like I remember being like, well, if I believe the Bible and if I believe in all these things, then I also believe in like demons and the devil and like realizing that like spirit, like things that some people would say are obviously made up. I was like, well, if I believe the structure, like with it comes this like darkness as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Leslie, if you ever read is it Frank Peretti? Did you ever read those novels? Yes. This Present Darkness. <laughs> I read all those, like, they're like just like Christian horror novels. And I read yes. like all yep, of them. Yep. <laughs> and, and I also read a lot of like non-Christian. I mean, I read like, I read like, you know, Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein and like all those books that were like for kids our age, like, you know, um, Lois Duncan, like those were all, that was all stuff that I was also reading as well. John Bellier's. But yeah, there definitely was like a like a religious tinge to the whole process, which was interesting. Which and that that sort of love of that feeling, like that tickly anxiety inducing like temperature change that horror creates in me, has that that feeling has been very remains very appealing, even though I have long ago abandoned my faith. Like I have not been religious in many years, but years, but years, but but the desire for connecting to something larger than yourself, I think is very real. And then the anxiety that comes with that. And I'm a very anxious person. So it does seem strange that like I would gravitate towards that. But I think I've always gravitated towards stuff that made me feel something and made me uncomfortable. Um, and I've just, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I would like read horror novels and, and then I would have nightmares and be up you know, would leave the lights on. My mother would be like, what is, and if she'd find like a Christopher Pike book in my backpack and be like, what is this? Like, I told you we're allowed to read these. You don't sleep right when you read these, you know. And, and so for me, I don't know. Yeah. And it's just like, it just kind of, it's just evolved from that from since then. And I remember when I first started writing, I'm trying to think of the first story that I wrote that felt like horror. It might have been especially heinous. I, I'm not sure time. I mean, I just, at some point I was like, this is what interests me. Like I remember the first story that I wrote in my grad program, which was like terrible and has never been published and no one will ever see it. But I remember my classmates feedback in workshop being like, okay, this is pretty bad, <laughs> which like they were correct. But a classmate of mine observing that the only place where this sort of dreadful, like realist story about like a woman whose father dies, it was just very tedious there was a moment where like death appears to her and they have a conversation and my classmates were like, here's where the story comes alive. Like mm -hmm. everything else is kind of bullshit, but like this is where the story seems to really activate. And I think it's cause I was like dealing with stuff that was interesting to me. The idea of like a person, the sort of slipstream, puncturing of reality, horror, death, like, yeah, anyway. So, and then, and then, yeah, and then it just became my project. And it's always, and it's just like a thing that, it's a genre that I turn to for comfort. I mean, it seems weird, but like all I want to watch in the pandemic is musicals and horror movies. That's like the only thing I want to watch nowadays. So yeah, so now, I don't know. It's just has been there forever. And if um, especially heinous was sort of the first one that you'd worked on that that has this sort of violence against women aspect. Like it's not exactly the horror. Strangely, that's not the the surreal aspect in it. But right. um, it, it does seem like the the feminism and horror do seem to parallel each other closely. Well, and I think that horror, because like so much of horror has to do with our vulnerabilities, right? It's like what we're afraid of. And so it just seems like almost like a natural, not a weakness in a bad way, but like a place where it's like, we're already sort of like touching some sort of very intense vulnerability hole in like reality and I feel like horror is just like sorry this metaphor is very messy it doesn't make any <laughs> sense but like I feel like it's like yeah they, they, just, they sort of speak to each other and I think this is also why like I feel like horror is a genre that can be sort of used to many ends I mean I feel like what, I, I've, what I've been talking about a lot in interviews is like thinking about like the work of Jordan Peele and like how his movies are sort of using are using horror as a way of like talking about sort of race and I mean like there's like so like there's not it's not just you know gender or feminism like there's like a lot of ways in which um, yeah, like horror is just able to sort of just like, it's like turning the rock over and seeing kind of what's underneath and 
I don't know. And like, and like letting people sort of take their fears and, and their, and, and their anxieties and, ma- and magnify them to this like very high degree. Um, sure. Uh, Leslie, you were saying well, something yeah. before. Oh, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I um, you know, just sort of speaking to what Carmen just said, I love, um, I did not particularly enjoy the sensation of being scared. <laughs> Um, um, and you know, I, I, cause I, I think I, you know, I had, um, recurring night terrors for a decade as a cat, you know, from the first time I was three, five, 13. And so, um, I, I do not enjoy, I did not enjoy the sensation of fear, but I'm very familiar with it. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm writing and I think about wanting a story to have a particular sensation, right. And, you know, how, you know, how do I, how do I get this feeling across? I mean, like, Fear is a very easy one for me to go to because it's like I, you know, it's a, and so it is. Um, uh, it it can feed the the craft in that way as well. Um, I'm I'm you know, working on a a novel that um, that has um, more horror than I think I in, in, intended um, because it's such an easy place for like my internal compass to turn turn towards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, I mean, hopefully this question is intelligible, but when, if you move into this larger form with a bigger space for horror, what happens? Like, can you tell us a little about that territory you're in? Um, oh my, so without giving away um, anything at all <laughs> about the novel itself, um, I think that um, I have, uh, I think that, at least for me, what has happened is that I have, um, there is an arc to it that perhaps was not present in um, in, um, in the short story where I keep returning to a particular sensation um, over and over. And, you know, that it's like, I know that there's, yeah, I'm still in the process of, of, of writing the novel and, and I know that there's something, there's something there that, um, that like my story is looking for. And um, I haven't, I haven't quite figured that out yet. Okay, but the, the arc of the horror moves you there. <laughs> um, so both of you also, um, employ techniques from myth, retelling myths, repurposing myths, and it occurred to me that that's another um, mode that touches on these very deep sort of human emotional experiences, and of course is related to the religious experiences you both just surprised me by talking about. (laughs) Um, How do these two tools fit together in your toolbox? Like, is there, do you feel like you employ them differently? Like myth and horror together, or yeah, yeah, or I, I don't know what, what makes you um, at a moment turn to the the scary feeling of horror, and what makes you perhaps at a different moment um, reach for uh, sort of grabbing something from myth. Well, I feel like urban legends, fairy tales, myths, folk tales. Uh, in a way do sort of similar things to horror but also do them across like languages and countries and cultures you know so it's like you you know there's like versions of I don't know Cinderella or whatever and like you can see it like different versions of it and the way that that, as a story and like stories that are like it are similar to it um that also reflect anxieties and fears that people have um and ideas that they have uh and then also like it persists throughout again throughout history and throughout you know th- across different cultures and things like that so i feel like they're in a way it's like almost like horror horror that then lasts for a long time because like, <laughs> myth and folk tales and, you know what i mean uh yeah. and it's like the horror that i guess i'm thinking of when i think of this question is like more immediate for me it's like in the last you know in the last century or two you know work that i'm familiar with but obviously like those stories stories that unsettle you and and also that like magnify your anxieties have existed forever right as long as people have been telling stories 
Uh, yes, I, um, you know, uh, myths, mythology is enduring. Um, every single culture has has its own mythology, its own um, fairy tales, its own folk tales. And uh, for me, I feel like that speaks to the fact that, you know, there is something that these, this mythology gets at um, in the human experience that we all, all people of all cultures um, have you know, gravitated, gravitated towards creating these uh, these stories. And so, um, you know, as, as, as a storyteller, uh, you know, sort of continuing in the tradition, I have always found mythology to be particularly interesting, um, you know, as, especially if we now, you know, categorize um, religion as mythology, which is its own, you know, it's its own sort of mythology. And um, there's something, you know, there's something interesting about the stories people tell about themselves and about their own cultures. And so um, something about, you know, I, I like the idea of uh, as somebody who's present in the world now creating new mythologies and, you know, um, creating stories that also speak to that sort of same, you know, visceral internal human thing that past mythologies did as well. Yeah. Um, both of you write beautifully about relationships uh, between women, whether they're friendships or family relationships or romantic relationships. Um, and they're just these uh, very rich spaces of paranoia and warmth and tension and comfort. And when you, when you think of these, um, do you conceive of your characters in groups? Like how do you, when you go about uh, building a relationship in a story, do people come to you in pairs, maybe? Or is there, is there always one character with a with a desire who, That's who a creates good question. the rest? Um, I think it depends on the story. Um, uh, but usually, typically, a, a character will come to me, and then I will I, I come to the other characters by populating the world around her. And I am, you know, my my world is very much a world of women. Um, and so, you know, that's that's uh, sort of the first place I, I that, you know, it's, just, it's it's natural. I mean, it's it's um, it's just the way that um, I conceive of um, the world that my characters live in. But um, you know, I I think it's important that um, you know when I do write that that my characters reflect that broad spectrum of you know terrible and and wonderful and um and i find um and yeah you know, I, I mentioned this specifically because you know i i sort of heard a couple of things um from um readers particularly nigerian readers of mine who will say you know um who will say oh this is not like i, I didn't think of this um, story is feminist because the, a woman did something wrong, and I'm mean, like, that's oh not like God. you don't you're you're complete you don't understand what feminism is. You don't like yeah. You know, it's but so for me, it's very important that the world of women is dense and complicated as it is in real life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of a particular story in which a mother is very abusive to her daughter and has her sort of have accidents in order to get money through a lawyer. Uh, like that one immediately sprang to mind as. Um, I, mean, I mean, there's an ele element of humor to it, too. It almost felt like you went to such a dark place with that character um, that there sort of had to be this little laughing edge to it. Absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. I, um, I often, um, I, you know, um, I, 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 humor for me is just such a great way to sort of ease um, pressure and to complicate stories, especially when they are dark. Mm -hmm. um, I you know, in, in enjoy employing humor to do that. And yeah, in, the, you know, in a particular story like that, where, um, you know, you know, where, where you know, a, a character is, um, entirely um sort of you know uh, negatively inclined um i found that you know i find find it important for stories like that to um have a counterbalance whether that counterbalance is something that is you know sort of emotional and touching or in this case humor yeah of course um Carmen, same question for you. Do you, is it always just like, does your mind light up with one character and everything sort of like fills itself out from there? Is that? 
Uh, kind of. I mean, I am not, I feel like some writers are very like character focused. Like uh -huh. they're like, oh, a character appeared to me. I, I don't have that experience very often. I, I tend to come from like a place of like a what if or yeah. a scenario or like a sort of mode of inquiry or form and the character emerges sort of based on what that what I'm trying to do it, it's sort of hard to it's sort of hard to yeah, explain but like yeah I I don't I don't know. I feel like it's pretty rare that a character appears to, mm -hmm. to me and like, I feel like I'm following them. Um, but usually it's like they're, I'm sort of uncovering them as I'm working on the story. So it's, it's not quite so direct. Um, but I also am very much, I mean, like Leslie, I feel like the world of women being like dense and complicated is like really important to me as well. Like that's a, um, sort of women, I mean, you know, showing like women's experiences in all their, sort of beauty and ugliness and complications, I feel like is, I don't know, it just, to me, that's like very important. And yeah, it's part of my project. Yeah, and it, it comes across um, so wonderfully. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, you know, there is, you know, sort of, um, you know, something Carmen said reminded me of, um, um, you know, writing and having, uh, either you know having a character sort of appear to you or um yeah so that is something that happens to me often <laughs> uh a character will appear to me or usually like a line of dialogue will appear to me and then the person who spoke it um but um there have also been you know stories that uh, unfolded with um you know having a like a, a scenario a what if scenario um, um be the the driving force, particularly the title story of of the of the of my collection mm -hmm. was one of those stories where mm -hmm. I did I had a world before I had a I had a person, uh -huh. and, um, and yeah, it, so it, it like it it varies how it the stories appear. Sure, and I mean world building being so important for sort of fantasy, right? I could I could totally imagine with that story how the scenario would come first. Um, but Leslie, you've said elsewhere that your stories are basically non-biographical, but they draw on issues that are important to you. So the 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 actual scenarios are not biographical, but maybe the the themes are. Um, could it be that both fictionalizing things and using elements of the fantastic um, are ways to create distance to look at difficult issues? Absolutely. Um, um, I don't like. I, I really don't like the idea of writing about myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll have to, I'm going to have to explore that at some point. But um, I, I find that. Um, uh, you know, when I say like you know, writing about you know things that you know are important to me, I don't usually approach a story you know with like an issue in mind. But I'm you know I'm I'm a person living in the world with concerns, and you know so the, my stories naturally gravitate towards those concerns. Um, and I do find that um, you know because fiction um, um, and you know the the speculative elements do help to create distance, but I find them to also be very illuminating, particularly with uh, speculative aspects. And I think of, um, so, you know, having, let's say, you know, a particular human experience in the real world, um, you know, so you know, the analogy I like to use is, okay, here's a room that is entirely blue. The floors are blue, the walls are blue, the, you know, um, the couch, everything's blue. Um, and then, you know, and I'm gonna take a vase from this, this room and, this blue room and put it in a room that's entirely yellow. It's the same phase, nothing has changed about it, but just by putting it in a setting that is um, unfamiliar, that is strange, it, it gives it a different dimension. Sure, absolutely. Um, Carmen, do you, do you feel like um, fantastic elements are sort of a distancing tool for you? Is that, would that, be fair like distancing or perspective lending it's so interesting i was just thinking about what leslie was saying because i it's i did i did an event with um jennifer egan a while back and they did this like little pre-event interview and the person asked like why do you write and i was like oh to know myself better and, and jennifer like looked astonished and she was like oh i write to get as far away from myself as possible 
And I was like, that is very interesting. <laughs> and I feel like everybody needs to be discussing that with their respective therapist or whoever. That's very, it's all very interesting. <laughs> But for me, I feel like speculative elements are actually my way of trying to break into the story a little better. I mean, I I similarly, like, you know, people ask me a lot, and I'm sure ask Leslie this, people ask us a lot of writers, like, oh, oh, is this story autobiographical? Like, is did this happen to you? Or, you know, and which I people just like to know that. I don't really know why. But, but for me, it's interesting because, like, a lot of my stories, like, they might have, like, biographical, like, tidbits in them like for example my story the resident in my first collection i was a girl scout and i did go to a camp in the place that i'm writing about and i also have been to residencies as a writer but that is the end of the autobiographical material like everything else is completely it's completely made up like these characters are made up the protagonists all things that happen to her are made up but it is a story that feels very like uh, it's like it's like the autobiography of my brain, like figuring out the problem of the story. So it's like you can track like kind of what, how I'm thinking in that case about narratives about like women and madness and artistic creation, like that sort of what that story is about. And so, and so, so you can sort of track how I'm thinking about it, which is in a way very autobiographical, right? It's very mm -hmm. like you're very much in my brain, but you're not actually getting like an account of real things that happened. Um, and for me, like the sort of speculative elements are just a way to almost like speed up that process a little bit um, where it's like, you know, the kind of something that might happen to a character over the course of many years can be really sped up by like a night in a haunted house or something. <laughs> like I, I feel like, I feel like it's, it's just an interesting, it's just like an interesting tool. So yeah, so I think for me, it's like a way of, I don't know. And I think I think a lot in, in life, like I don't believe in ghosts, but I think a lot like what would happen if like, a ghost appeared right now? Or like, what would happen if this, if this took place? Or what would it be like if time travel? You know, I, I feel like I'm always sort of doing these like what if scenarios in my brain, which is where like half my story ideas come from. So, so yeah, I don't know. But for me, it's always actually, I'm, I'm moving toward not myself in like a sort of woo woo sort of way, but like what I'm thinking, what I really think about something what something really meant to me. Like that's kind of what I'm trying to work out often. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Your memoir is called The Dream House. And this title and this recurring motif um, have a lot of horror resonance for me. There, you know, there's sort of like the, the, the idea of a haunted house is certainly in there among other things. Um, could you talk a little about developing that motif or choosing it? Yeah, well, I, I was trying to write about the events of the memoir for a very long time and everything I wrote was like truly awful. Like I just wrote a lot of very, very bad essays and nonfiction and just sort of attempts to try at this book. And I was just stuck. I was like, I, it's not working. I don't really know why, whatever. And then I was I was actually teaching at this like summer camp for teenagers, this camp that I would have like have murdered to have gone to when I was a teen, but I never got to. Um, but so this like camp, like, so, and, and the way that I teach is very genre focused. Like when I teach, I always like have genre as the focus of each week. So I'll be like, this week we're talking about horror and this week we're talking about, you know, uh, science fiction or fantasy or whatever. And so I was talking a lot about genre every day with all these teenagers and was just sort of like, here are all my, here's a brain dump, my thoughts about haunted houses. Like here's a brain dump about whatever. And so, um, yeah, and so I was just thinking a lot about it. It was very active in my mind and I was walking, I had a lot of free time and I was walking through town. And I just at some point began thinking like, what if I'm not, what if I should, what if I thought about this project as like more of a Gothic project or like a haunted house? Mm -hmm. or something and then soon that kind of blossomed out into like thinking about a lot of different genres but the metaphor of, of the house became very sort of central to the book not only because you know narrative of domestic violence often happen at sort home. of within the confines of the house or the home yeah but also like you know the home is like a space of domesticity which you think of as like sort of the the realm of women right and we think of homes and homes we have all these like sort of idioms about homes like safe as houses and you know and all these ways of thinking about home, home is where the heart you know so it just the home just seemed to be a really interesting recurring theme 
that just really spoke to me um, and ended up becoming sort of the center of the project. Yeah, and it's fascinating how it offers um, such a range of associations and structure. Um, but let's talk about another thing that's really basic, which is motherhood. Um, both of you have stories where you rethink motherhood, um, not, not just socially, but biologically. Uh, in Leslie's story, um, Who Will Greet You at Home, women literally create their babies from materials they find in their environment. And in uh, one of Carmen's stories, Mothers, a lesbian couple conceives a child. Um, what's it like to redefine something so fundamental? I mean, it must be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Very powerful. I feel like I'm yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't really think that that was what I was doing um, when I when I wrote. I sort of I had you know this idea of, of this you know child, life child made out of fiber came um, you know came to me, and I um, and I you know I, I I sort of started constructing this the story around it. But I was not. I was not so. I was not so far removed that I was um, able to. Uh, I was thinking, oh, I'm you know, redefining um, mother. So that's not something that I um, sort of was conscious about as I was writing. Um, but of course, it's something that uh, I have sort of since since thought about. And um, yeah, I think that you know what surprised me um, when I was writing the story. Um, and you know, this again happened to me afterwards. Was that I did not, as I was as I was writing the story, I did not intend to write a story without men. Um, that that just happened. Um, I I was you know I I like to sort of mind my character's business when you know they when I'm in a character's a particular character's head, and I sort of you know minded her business so much that you know. Um, her, her, you know, her focus on becoming a mother was was so, you know, was you know, that, that's what she was hyper focused on. And Carmen, what about your experience of recreating motherhood in your story? Well, I also, I, I mean, like Leslie, I was not sort of that wasn't really part of my project. I mean, I, I am not a mother. Um, I feel like my interest in using that sort of uh, using this idea that like these two women could have had a baby together in the story mothers was more about imagining what would happen if you created a link with this person who has abused you and who is no longer in your life, but you have this, you have this thing that you made, um, which is a thing that I think a lot of people, a lot of straight people or people who, you know, have biological children experience where you you have a child with somebody who you're no longer with or who, you know, who possibly has been very bad and there's this like weird connection. But I was imagining what is sort of the gay version of that and what does that look like? Um, yeah, so again, it wasn't quite so conscious about like redefining motherhood. I mean, like, I mean, I don't have kids. If I ever have kids, like maybe I'll have thoughts about that. But for me, it was more of a tool um, to just sort of get at this idea of, interrogating abuse and interrogating sort of yeah like queer violence and queer relationships so sure and the, the Let, sort of investments that people have in each other it's almost like an, an embodiment of what the relationship means at that point yeah exactly exactly Carmen, I watched an interview with you uh at the 2017 Miami book fair where you were talking about Kelly Link, someone who's influenced you and sort of uh, the way her writing liberated you. And one of the elements you listed as liberating was never thinking that one's reader is stupid, um, believing in one's readers. And I, I love that because one of the great pleasures of reading your books is how full of surprise and challenge they are and things that, you know, I'm always thinking, oh, people don't usually throw that at me. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, if you, if you have these great intelligent readers, uh, have they surprised you with their responses? What's what do you what do you hear back from these great people? <laughs> oh, it's such a good question. I mean, I think you know, I think the challenge. I I think you know, there's this weird balance with writing where 
you both don't want to think about your audience at all because you can, I feel like that way leads mad, lies madness. Like you could work yourself into a hole, like obsessing over like what this audience member or that audience member will think when in fact you don't know who your readers are going to be. And like one of the cool things about writing is that like your readers are people who like might not even be born yet. Like people whose existences you can't even fathom. Like I read work by authors who like certainly never imagined me as their reader and like that's okay because like that's reading is or writing and reading is like that you're like creating this bridge like across time and across culture and language and all these things and so in some ways you can't think about your reader because it's just too much and you have to just think about writing the thing you want to write um but yeah my readers always like have like really like have told me some like just really interesting like they'll be like oh like i always assume that like this that that like this story like this was the twist or like I always assume that um, like people assume different things about different characters or they'll be like, I always assume that after the story ended, this happened. And I'd be like, well, I mean, if you imagine that, like that's, I mean, I didn't write that, but like, I don't know. Like, I feel like this, the cool thing is just like having readers who have taken the work and making it their own um, for better or for worse. And I mean, that's, I mean, I, everybody's readers are like that in some way, but I feel like there's some kind of writing and work that like leaves space for readers to enter. And that's the kind of work that I like to read as a reader where I feel like there's space for me and sort of my musings and my eccentricities. Um, and I don't know, that's the kind of work that really speaks to me as a, as a reader. So I hope to provide that for my readers as a writer as well. If that oh, makes sense. That's such a wonderful, capacious, long-term vision. Yeah, Leslie. I uh, yeah. actually would love to add um, to that. You know, I, um, it, you know, Carmen is phrase in that, you know, like thinking, having, think of, a, of an audience as you're writing, like, you know, it's like, it's like having someone looking over your shoulder as you're, it's like, it's like you can't, you know, you can't be entirely um, free. However, you know, um, something that I did um, do very deliberately, um, think in terms of like configuring and figuring an audience as I was writing is that I assumed an audience with default knowledge in the sense that mm. I was not going to explain various aspects of Nigerian culture. I just assumed an audience with maybe, you know, probably the, the same um, level of dexterity as I have. And so I did not, um, like, and, and for me, that was, that was really important. And I also, you know, find it, you know, it, it, you know, particularly as a, um, as an, a uh, Nigerian writer, as an African writer, um, because so much of, um, of our work has been assumed for a, a non-Nigerian, non-African audience, I wanted to make sure that that was not something that I would ever, like, think about. And, um, and, you know, and uh, the result of that, it, is you know that um, I found like the right readers for me, um, both inside and outside of of, of Nigeria, because um, you know I I don't believe that an audience needs to be spoon fed um, mm -hmm. in that capacity, and you know when we think about you know if we had if we were, had, we were to have a, sort of a global discussion about what art is like what an artist is doing, there'll be many different answers, but. I, I think that a significant number of people would arrive at the idea of like a, an, um, an artist expressing some inner part of himself. And I think like when, you know, what does it mean when we look at, so what does it mean to look at an African artist, a Nigerian artist, and assume that their expression of themselves is for a white western audience like i think that that's that's definitely that's something that you know like a, there's something very ugly about that mm -hmm. and so um for me it was important that um like my default audience shared the same knowledge that i did right and you know um you are actually absolutely proven right that you don't need to do that because you've been accoladed across continents it's you know there there's um such residents in the united states and um do you notice a difference in the way that um, Nigerian, you, you talked a little bit about Nigerian women's response to your writing. Do you notice a difference in how they respond versus other audiences? Um, you know, yeah, yeah, this, yes, I mean, um, I, I am lucky that my work has been well received 
both inside of Nigeria and and um, outside. It it's, has been, um, you know, received pretty well. And um, I think that for my Nigerian audience, um, I, I I realize that their experience is always going to be different from um, a, a Western audience in a in a good way, um, in the sense that. I am speaking because I'm speaking to them. Um, there is a layer of a story that everyone gets, and then there might be something like elements that uh, a Nigerian only audience would get. And the example I like to sort of bring up when I talk about that is in the story Skinned. Um, you know, there is um, uh, a part of the, you know, the, the character and protagonist is watching a news um, cast, and um, there is a reference to uh, like the largest market town um, in the country um, called Inicha. And you know that's you know for for um, uh, uh, outside audience, like you know all the all that they need to know is that it's a market town and this is where like the weaving of the cloth happens, etc. Mm -hmm. But you know for Nigerians, they know like the, the like the significance of naming the largest town in the market town in the country Onitsha, you know, like something like that, you know, things like that. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I think you know it. I've had um, it's been uh, received um, pretty well um, by the Nigerian, my Nigerian audience, um, particularly. Um, uh, younger audiences and i would say younger you know i'll be very generous with younger and saying like, like under 40 <laughs> and um and um and i think and uh, but for me what i um what i sort of appreciate about that particular aspect um is with um young writers uh, aspire, young aspiring Nigerian writers who now, who are, you know, not now, I think the other, other people who have done it before me, but who um, are being sort of more encouraged to have that insular perspective and understand that have, speaking to each other is not something, is not a, a minimization of, mm -hmm. of anything. Yeah. You're right. Oh, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for this wonderful discussion. Um, it was really my pleasure. Thank you so much for having yeah, thank us. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.